and how ashamed we feel to be living in this world. And I want to make that a little bit of our conversation. And I also want to speak for a moment, and I, I want to acknowledge a couple of people before I begin. First of all, I want to acknowledge Chaya, who invited me. Uh, the moment I started working in Houston, she said, you have to come. And I said I would, and I'm pleased to be here, and it's an honor to be most especially with you. I had the feeling, and I think we all had the feeling, that we would have bequeathed to the next generation a better world than the world in which we live. And that poses a responsibility on all of us to deal and grapple with the world in which we live, and also to grapple with the event which unites us which we struggle to present and to represent to the world. Let me take a survey for, let me begin with a, a dream. You're going to be surprised at the dream. The dream is I'd love to live in a world in which the Holocaust were irrelevant. If you asked me how I would love to conclude a museum, I would love to conclude a museum with the statement, this is how 20th century humanity behaved toward each other. And we have learned so much that 21st century humanity could not behave like this. And yet, the overwhelming sense that we have is that 21st century humanity is fully capable of misbehaving in ways that echo, not parallel, not equate, not equivalent, not the same as, that echo the way in which 20th century humanity behaved. I'm going to take you for a moment through the complex world of anti-Semitism. And I'm going to argue three things that you have to hold in parallel. Anybody who tells you that this is the Holocaust re reborn doesn't understand what we're talking about. Doesn't understand the Holocaust and doesn't understand contemporary anti-Semitism. But to say this is not the Holocaust reborn is not to negate the seriousness of anti-Semitism. It's merely to say that people who struggle with the last war lose the next one. And that is, you can't refight an old world war, you have to look at a new war. Let me take you for a very brief, very quick tour of the horizon. One. If you ask demographically all the sociological studies, you'd be surprised to discover that Judaism is the most popular religion in the United States of America. Now let me tell you why. Uh, number one, the Roman Catholic Church has an enormous crisis. The crisis was the loss of credibility of its leadership because of the sexual abuse issues, and also the dramatic disconnect between the preaching of the cardinals and the bishops and the behavior of the Catholic populace. Rabbis are used to their congregations not listening to them. Catholic, <laughs> Catholic uh, bishops and cardinals are not, and we may all have papal envy because this is a unique spiritual figure. But the reality is on two key issues, on the percentage of Catholics who use contraception and the percentage of Catholics who have abortions, their percentage in the population is exactly equal to the general population. And therefore there's this dramatic disconnect within the Roman Catholic Church, a disconnect that the Pope may be trying to heal, but there's still a good deal of anger 
within and also institutional crisis because of what happened. Protestantism is divided between evangelicals and liberals. Evangelicals don't like liberals, liberals don't like evangelicals, and moderates are despised by both. <laughs> What's new? What's new? Nobody likes the Muslims, and nobody understands the Eastern religions, and consequently Judaism is ironically the most popular religion in America. <laughs> I'm serious. But if I ask you a question, how many of you believe that anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States? Almost all of you would raise your hands. Now why, how can that be that Judaism on the one hand is the most popular religion in America, and anti-Semitism is on the rise in our perception of reality in America? And the answer to how do you hold contradictory things? And the answer to that is, the reason for that is you have to understand anti-Semitism in the context of a world in which hatred is expressed rather than repressed, and which hatred also experiences communities of fellow travelers that are available now on the internet and that have a magnified presence because they speak to each other and because it echoes all the way through. So we have a phenomenon of anti-Semitism demographically is a dramatic decrease, significant decrease, and yet the perception is that anti-Semitism is on the increase, but that perception must be felt in the context in which hatred is widely expressed in society. Hatred all over the place is widely expressed in society and consequently we feel its repercussions. Let's talk for a moment about anti-Semitism in Europe. And I want you to distinguish now in a very basic way between anti-Semitism in and anti-Semitism of. Let me repeat it because I'm going to make a subtle point. Anti-Semitism in and anti-Semitism of. The irony is that anti-Semitism in Europe is on the rise, and anti-Semitism of Europe is on the decline. What's the difference? Essentially, let's use France as an example. Essentially, if you accept French values, liberty, equality, fraternity, you find the Jews a natural participation in France as Muslims, as Catholics, as secular, and you've accepted them as part of the landscape of France. But you have a massive Muslim migration to Europe that is in Europe but not of Europe. No assimilation has taken place, and consequently, they do not respond necessarily to the events of Europe, but they respond correlating to the events of the Middle East. And when you have criticism of Israel, they regard it as licensed to attack the Jew next door. And there's a direct correlation between when you have events exploding in the Middle East and you have, in addition to events exploding in the Middle East, you have attacks against Jews within European society. Absolutely. That's a problem now that has caught the attention of the European leaders. And you had this unusual situation when you had the attack on uh, Hyper Kasher and the murder of those Jews, you have the unusual situation of the president and the prime minister of France saying France without its Jews is not France. And then a mistake <coughs> by the Israeli prime minister who instead of building upon that, <coughs> 
who instead of building upon that, then uses the occasion to say, we will protect you in Israel, which reinforces the view that Jews are not entitled to live or not an authentic part of Jewish life in France and in Europe. We will protect you and then at the same time, but what, remember we face nuclear annihilation because of the potential in Iran. So what you have then is you have a phenomenon of an unassimilating population that has been used as guest workers, now residents for a long time, who don't see themselves as acculturating to France. And in England, for example, they see themselves as alienated from England itself and from its values. And therefore, they become a, a permanent underclass, which, by the way, says something to us about the genius of America, which has always been the assimilation of immigrants. And the, children, and the immigrants themselves, as you know better than anyone else, become the most patriotic elements of American society. And for those of you who are children survivors of the Holocaust, you've imbued, you've lived the values of America and celebrate America and believe in America. Those of you who are children of survivors, there was no one more patriotic toward America than your parents' generation. They understood all that America had to offer, and they were graced by living in America and blessed by living in America, and none of them had a yearning to return back to the Europe from which they left. So the anti-Semitism that you have there is an anti-Semitism that is in but not of and increasing in but not of. Because that population is increasing and the societies have to assimilate them in order for them to function. You have the massive migration of anti-Semitic myths from Christian Europe to Muslim world. Meaning what had been rejected in post-Holocaust Christianity, including, for example, the blood libel, including the idea that Jews poison the well, the conspiracy, the protocols of the elders of Zion, what became squashed, it's almost a whack-a-mole, what became squashed in the Christian world erupted in the Muslim world. And on that, you have several factors that are intriguing because you have a new factor that has come into play, which is you have non-state elements. You have anti-state and non-state elements, and consequently, they have a freedom to express rage in a way that has never, uh, that states do not have because states have particular consequences when such rage is, ex is expressed. So therefore what you have is you have in the Muslim world a dramatic sense of anti-Semitism, you have failed states, and you have a good deal of despair which is the earth from which anti-Semitism grows. Now there's also some good news there despite the bleak picture. The irony is that two contradictory things are taking place there. One contradictory thing is that Israel is not no longer regarded as the major problem in the region because the reality is that you have an inter-religious, an intra-religious warfare between Sunni and Shiite that is taking place all over the place. And America, which thinks in secular categories, doesn't understand how deep and how profound the religious divide is. And Israel right now has a strategic alliance with Jordan, with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt, and that's an alliance that, again, has even allowed in Egypt a program about 
the old Jewish quarter to be the most popular television program in Egypt today. You ironically, a decade ago, you had a 41 part series on the protocols of the elders of Zion. And now you ironically have a portrayal of Jews as ordinary human beings and as Egyptians from the old Jewish quarter taking place there. Only a fool would predict what's going to happen in the Middle East, but it's going to heat up again and again because part of what happened, uh, that part of what's happening right now is the Palestinians are feeling a desperation and then extremists are not being countered in either community, Jew or Arab. They're not being countered by moderates. So consequently, we have a different rampant, we have a different portrait of anti-Semitism. Now, let's say it clearly. This is not 1933. It's not 1938. It's not 1942. It's 2015. Imagine and the reason it's not is because the world is different, at least partly. And the most important is we are different. Let me give you the most basic example of where we are different. If you had to bet the life of yourself and your children and your grandchildren on one of two propositions, that Iran would get a free shot at Israel and be able to annihilate it, or that Israel would attack Iranian nuclear facilities, which way would you bet? The fact that you can raise the question tells you that we are different. I don't want to come to a conclusion, but the fact that you can raise the question tells you that we are different. And that means that Jews learn something about powerlessness and have assumed power. And we have the capacity, we have the capacity to defend ourselves in a way we never had that capacity. And that's dramatic difference. The other is, imagine now, some of you are from France. Imagine if you had heard the Prime Minister of France in 1941 saying, France without Jews is not France. Okay. Imagine if you had heard the Chancellor of Germany, the very role that Adolf Hitler had, say essentially what anti-Semitism is antithetical to every German value that we hold. Imagine if you lived in a world in which the most pro-Israel state in Europe is now Poland, perhaps rivaled only by the Czech Republic. And the irony is that if you go into the synagogues of Poland, there are no barriers, no metal detectors, no guards. The doors are open, the gates are wide open, and the Jews feel secure, even in Poland. And again, you understand that this is not 33, 38, it's not even 1871. It's a very different world. Let's put anti-Semitism on one side. We have succeeded collectively as a generation, as two generations. We have succeeded in making the Holocaust what, I, what I've called in my own work the negative absolute of the contemporary world. You don't know what's good, you don't know what's bad, you live in a world that is relative, and consequently the one thing you do know is that the Holocaust was evil and awful and terrible and absolute evil, and consequently 
If you want to scream that something is evil, what do you say? Nazi, Holocaust, Auschwitz. And all of a sudden things get enormously distorted. I was speaking to um, the director of the Houston Museum on Friday. She said, you must have been a busy man yesterday. A uh, busy man Friday. Why was I busy? Because one of the candidates for president, and I don't mean this to attack any candidate, one of the candidates for, for, for president uh, of the United States said that if only the Jews had had guns, the Holocaust would not have taken place. <laughs> Without understanding that, you know, the armies of France had guns, the army of Poland had guns, the Soviet Union had guns. Uh, that guns wasn't the issue, something much larger and much more dramatic was. And even if you look in our world in which you have the combatants between civilians and states and rebels and resistance, and this and the other, and the other thing, you have 200,000 people being killed in what? In Syria? You have more than 500,000 people who have been killed in Iraq and you have murders every day of thousands taking place in a world which is highly armed. So whatever the issue you have with regard to guns, and I don't want to get into that, the one thing we know is that wasn't a simple, wasn't a simple equation. But more than that, Because we've succeeded in portraying the Holocaust as so fundamental and as so regarding the standard of evil, that means that comparisons are offered which tend to trivialize the nature of the Holocaust and also tend to exaggerate everything that's happening now. Not to say that it's not serious, not to say that it's not important, but exaggerating it in a very dramatic way and trying to offer an analogy where analogies don't work. That's where I turn to what we are going through now with a dramatic transition. and where your role increases by the hour in importance. For many years, the burden of Holocaust memory and the protection of the integrity of Holocaust memory was borne by the adult survivors of the Holocaust. Anybody who was 18 at the end of the Holocaust, which means that in 1939 they were bar mitzvah. 1939 or 1940 they were bar mitzvah. Anybody who was 18 at the end of the Holocaust is now 88. They have gone and survivors have had a zest and a passion for life and an intensity of life and a commitment to life. And I've been, as all of you have had through the death of many survivors, and many of them have cheated the Malach HaMavet <laughs> many, many times, and very few of them go easily. But those who are still alive are aging. And those who are still alive don't have the energy that they had 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. Who's there to protect the integrity? Who's there to declare what is all right and what is not all right? And who's there to protect the memory? The first are the children's survivors of the Holocaust. Because for many years, you said, the adults don't take us seriously. What do you remember? You were only a kid. And they don't respect your own experience because they presume that children don't remember. Though in a very deep way, children can't articulate how deep the memory is. And children have a real feel for danger, 
and they very often also have a feel and a sense of looming disaster. And what I read in all the memoirs and testimonies that I hear of children survivors is that there is plenty that they remember which now as adults they can articulate and even which they have had to wrestle with because their memory sometimes conflicts with historical reality. Let me give you one example without challenging. We did a film about 10, 15 years ago on kinder transport. And we came up with a kinder transport for the 10,000 Jewish kids who were taken out of Austria, Germany, or Austria, which was then part of Germany, and the uh, Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, and Moravia in particular, and brought to England where they were raised in homes. Some of them good homes, some of them bad homes, etc. The very interesting thing that we had to come to terms with was that we could not expect or anticipate was that even though their parents were incredibly bold, perceptive, and brave to give up their children in order to save their lives, adult children understood that intellectually but felt abandonment emotionally. Understand the conflict. Their parents, by any objective standards, and I'm going to give you a paradox. The paradox of the Holocaust was once described, the pessimists left, the optimists died. <laughs> People who thought that Germany was terrible and getting worse made all of the all of the efforts imaginable to leave. And the people who said, "Okay, we can endure this and we can put up with this," they're the people who ultimately died, and that's true for many respects throughout. So the people who understood intuitively, who understood intuitively that things were going to be impossible and they weren't going to able to protect their children, gave their children away. Now many of us, if not all of us, are parents and grandparents. It's a step that's unimaginable to us. A step that's absolutely unimaginable to us. A heroic step. And on the other hand, their kids understood it, what? As abandonment. You read memoir after memoir after memoir where parent and child are reunited after the war. Children who hid, children who escaped, and parent and child all of a sudden don't know how to relate to each other because when the child left, they were six or seven or eight. When they come back, they're 14. They've lived on their own. They've endured. They've been on their own. And there's a, there's a joke about it, which is that and I'll give you an example from ordinary life. As a college professor, you always prepare your freshman students for going home on Thanksgiving. For three months, they've lived without anybody asking them what time you're going to be home, where you're going, what are you going to do? <laughs> and all of a sudden, they come home. This is a home they left three months ago. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the mothers and the fathers talk to them in ways that nobody's talked to them for three months, and they feel umbrage and insulted because nobody's recognized their new status. Now, imagine that after five years or six years or whatever have you, and imagine also that the parent who returns is a shadow of themselves. And you are dramatically different because in order to endure what you've endured, you've had to transform yourself, embolden yourself, steal yourself. And one expects a happy reunion and what one experiences is tension and difficulty and the conflict and the contradiction. So the first thing that I want to say to children survivors of the Holocaust is now is the time 
for you to claim your history. Now is the time also for you to what? For you to accept the mantle of leadership in this field because you are the last link between those who were there and those who were not there. And the second is that for children of survivors and grandchildren of survivors, with all the conflict and contradiction, with all the sense of ambivalence and ambiguity, you now have to step into the shoes and bear some of the responsibility that your parents' generation bore. Because there's a very interesting thing that's also happening. There's a, a tension out there and it's always a tension, it's a tension between the universal and the particular. There are those who want to universalize the Holocaust without, for, per, without remembering its particularity. And there are those who want to particularize the Holocaust without remembering its universality. And we have to reject both notions. We also have to reject the notion that the world that was created because of the power of Holocaust memory gets diminished or dismissed because we want to universalize without remembering the particular. Let me give you an example of what we have to aim for in this generation. I believe profoundly that what we're going through is nothing less than what the biblical generation went through as it remembered Egypt. No human struggle for freedom. No human struggle for freedom in the world, including places in the world which are distant from Christianity, Judaism, and Islam doesn't understand the question, who was Pharaoh? Who was Moses? What was enslavement? What is required to go forth from Egypt? What it's like to sojourn in the desert and what's the dream of the promised land? Negro spiritual when Moses was in Egypt land, go down Moses, tell old Pharaoh what? let my people go. You want to have a wonderful Seder, ask three questions, not four. <laughs> ask, who is your Pharaoh? Who or what is your Moses? And what's the journey to the Promised Land? Those are the only questions you have to ask and the Seder will take care of itself. If people can really share that. Now what did Jews do with the biblical story of the Exodus? We essentially made it into the profound narrative of freedom, the narrative of liberation, but we also made it into an ethical norm which said, therefore, we have to do A, B, C, D, E. We have to have Sabbath because man cannot, human beings cannot be a slave. We have to behave in such a way toward the widow and the orphan, toward the stranger, because we once were strangers in the land of Egypt. We made it into the ethical norm that guides our tradition. It remained particular, but it was transformed into the universal. And what I suggest to you is that the Holocaust has to do both. It has to handle that dialectic. Remain particular, a story that happened to one people with an intensity that it happened to no one else, even though there were other victims who must be included, who must be remembered. And then the generation that learned from that, the ethical norms that come forth from that, in 
including to be an upstander and not a bystander, including to be a rescuer and not what? Someone, not only not a victim, but also not, not someone who goes with what? Who come, becomes what? A collaborator. And to do that in such a way that is rooted in history and calls forth human morality. And if we do that, then we have cemented the place of this event as an ethical foundation for the contemporary world. Now, bad news. Any of us who are scholars in the field have a terrible problem. You know what our problem is? We can't keep up with our field. New books are being written literally every month that are terrific, that are earth-shattering and transformative, and that have real implications not only for the past but for the future. Let me touch on two. There's an interesting book by an Israeli logistics expert. Now you wonder, what is a logistic expert doing on the Holocaust? The logistic expert was an army logistics expert, expert who was used to moving troops and personnel, food and supplies through the small state of Israel. And he wrote a very important book called The Wehrmacht Against the Holocaust. And what he did was to say the following, transforms our understanding of the field. Virtually every historian could have told you that trains that were used to transport uh, Jews to their death camps could have been used to transport uh, troops to the, to the front and men and material and um, food to soldiers in the Soviet Union, in the occupied Soviet Union, and also to bring the wounded back. But what he did is he followed transport after transport after transport. And he discovered two dramatic things that are very important. One, he discovered that the two most intense points of the Holocaust were 1942 and 1944. You want to know it in figures, the following figure should haunt you. At the time of the Wannsee Conference on January 20th, 1942, 80% of the Jews who were to die in the Holocaust were still alive. 16 months later, 80% of the Jews who were to die in the Holocaust were already dead. You want to know the Holocaust? Study the year 1942. Now, what was 1942 in terms of German military battle? That was the year in which the, the Germans discovered that they were going to have to stay in the Soviet Union for a very long period of time that the war was not going to be a blitzkrieg, that it was going to take them months and years and not days or weeks. Now he told us, for example, there were 600,000 horses in the campaign against the Soviet Union. Horses require the following amounts of hay. The number of transports that are needed to bring hay to the hay to the front are the following number of trains, the number of trains used to transport the Jews were the following, and the Wehrmacht was fighting against those who wanted to kill the Jews. Those who wanted to kill the Jews, the Wehrmacht was fighting in order to fight the war. What's the second period? The second period is the period between May 8th and July, uh, between May 15th and July 8th, 1944, in which 437,402 Jews are shipped out of Hungary, primarily to Auschwitz, so 147 transports. What's happening during this period? Soviet Union is on the march from the east, 
the United States and the Allies have invested, have invaded from the West, June 6, 1944. Germany needs all of its rail resources to what? To fight a two-edged battle? And what's the point at which the battle of the Jews, the murder of the Jews, takes priority? That's the point. He doesn't quite argue that Germany would have, he does argue Germany would have had a much easier time fighting the war if it didn't kill the Jews. He doesn't quite argue that the Jews were the price that uh, the world paid for the defeat of Nazi Germany. But he shows you something else. He shows you that if you are ideologically committed to murder, to destruction, to decimation, you operate against your own best national interest. And that tells you something about what happens when rage overtakes the perception of national interest. And that, by the way, is something we have to be mindful of. I, there was an interview between, and I'm an ardent Democrat and supported the president even felt that the agreement with Iran was worthwhile because it was the, the best of all miserable alternatives. But President Obama didn't understand evil when he gave an interview to Jeffrey Goldberg who said, when he said that the nations ultimately act in their national self-interest. The problem in Nazi Germany was that the national self-interest to win the war to kill the Jews. And you have a very interesting thing, an example that the nation did not operate in national interest. Let's take one more example. There's a book that's now just recently been published by a brilliant writer by the name of Timothy Snyder. It's called The Black Years. Timothy Snyder had written a very fine book on the um, um, uh, called the Badlands on the war in Ukraine, and both on the famine and the Einsatz group in the 1930s and early 1940s phenomenon of what happened in Ukraine. He now turns to the Holocaust and what he says, which has to frighten the hell out of you, is the lessons of the Holocaust are manifold, its precedents are eternal and we had damn well better accept it as a warning if it does not become descriptive of our future. Now his argument is a very interesting argument, and for those of you from Eastern European backgrounds, it's an intriguing one. He says the Jews fared worst in the areas in which the governments were destroyed and there was sort of no government no functioning government. The areas of the occupied Soviet Union, which had undergone a transition from one form of government, Soviet occupation, then German occupation. And this is where the killing was most intense, and this is where the protection of laws and the norms of society were the weakest. And also, ironically, he says that the collaborators those who collaborated with the Soviet occupation were given a chance to kosher themselves. He doesn't use that word exactly, but to kosher themselves by collaborating with the German occupation. And if he introduced the concept before of double genocide, he now introduces the concept of double occupation. Now, why is this important? Because we're now living in a world in which there are a whole range of places in which government is not functioning. The largest description of the Middle East that we can say is the boundaries that were established by British imperialism in a century ago are collapsing in front of our eyes today. And the best view that we have is that we're going to have multiple tribal states in the future, and you have whole ranges of areas in which there are no governments. 
By the way, this should caution us about keeping our own government from getting into control of extremists of the right or the left, and with the idea that we don't come together and work out and solve problems becomes very dangerous for us. But his argument very simply is that no man's land, no government, no law, frontier society allow the powerful to do whatever the hell they want without any civic opposition and with total, total freedom, including the freedom of annihilation. Frightening argument, not a serious argument, but one that has to be taken very, 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 very important argument which again describes the potential for our world. And consequently, we have to look at what that means as we move into worlds in which people have their primary allegiance becoming a tribal allegiance. And tribal can also be ideological allegiance instead of a total allegiance to nation states, to laws, and to the range of what they of, of what they constitute. And consequently, we have to look at that and understand it and understand its implications, and we have to be a moral force in the world. Our success is astounding, but every success brings with it challenges, and now the question becomes whether we are ready and able to accept those challenges and whether you're ready to assume the burden, the privilege, and the responsibility of your own history. Now, as a person who is not a survivor, and I'll tell you a, a funny story, um, uh, I'm going to let me give the, the who's not a survivor and not the child of survivors, uh, I plead with you that your voice must be heard at this time because this transition can only be done responsibly if you maintain the sense of integrity and authenticity that is required. I'm going to tell you a humorous story. Um, there was an article last year at Sukkot, exactly a year ago at Sukkot, there was an article in the New York Times about the kids who were tattooing their grandparents' numbers on their arm. There was a um, very interesting thing, which is the third generation remembers what the second generation tries to forget. By the way, that's also true of the perpetrators as well, because the third generation, some the most interesting literature is the literature of the children of perpetrators who are coming to terms with who their grandparents were. So there are kids who are putting their tattoos of their numbers on their arm. And I was quoted in the New York Times by saying that um, this was not my this was a brazen form of remembrance. What wouldn't be my first choice, wouldn't be my second choice, wouldn't be my third choice. <laughs> but they're remembering. They identified me, misidentified me as the child of Holocaust survivors. And my old, my sister, who for this occasion admitted that she was my older sister, <laughs> she had subsequently become my much younger sister. <laughs> I wrote the New York Times editor, it was, it was uh, my sister is an Israeli, I'm an observant Jew, I don't deal with the internet or anything like that on the hallways. So I didn't, wasn't able to respond till Tuesday. I opened my email Tuesday night, I opened my email whatever the night after the holidays, and I see a letter of the New York Times editor from my sister. Um, Dear sir, I'm Michael Birnbaum's, I'd hate to admit, older sister. <laughs> I remember when my mother was pregnant with uh, Michael. I remember when he was born, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, and I have heard him say a thousand times, he is neither the child of survivors nor a survivor. 
but now, since I read that he's the child of survivors of the New York Times, I have to now check my personal memories <laughs> and my historical records because you are the paper of record. <laughs> and what the hell do I know? <laughs> the point being, ladies and gentlemen, you, you who are children of survivors, are now the only survivors we have. You are our children of survivors. You now have to assume responsibility for the history that you were given that you did not choose. But you have to choose it, and choose it in order to make a moral statement to our world, a world which is desperately in need of such testimony. Thank you very much. Chairs, do we have time for questions? Kaya? I don't think so. Sandy? Judy? Do we have any time for questions? Yes. Michael. I want to thank Michael right now for that incredibly thought-provoking lecture and a vitally important call to action to all of us. Okay, let's take those of you who have questions, please. Good. I will, I will repeat the question. Yes, where you uh, had urged us uh, uh, to be purveyors now of the ideas that uh, the uh, older generation had. Uh, how do we, you call, call us to action. What kind of action should we do? Okay. What kind of action is being, is, is being expected? Let me, let me talk uh, uh, very, very concretely. Number one, for many years all of the institutions of Holocaust remembrance were dependent on survivors as docents to meet with students and to lecture and to speak. That generation is no longer capable of doing it, or if they are, they are less and less strong. Somebody's got to step into the vacuum. Somebody's got to assume the public role of responsibility of responsibility for the memory of the Holocaust. You now have to step forward, not as children, but really as keepers of the legacy to assume that. Let me give a concrete example to second generation. What we're trying to recommend all over the place is that people create 20 minute or 25 minute um, clips of their parents' testimony. So the story can be told from the parents' perspective in such a way that when they go into classes, if they give it in 20 minutes, then they're there to answer and to speak a little bit about what it was like to be the child of, and or the grandchild of, and be able to answer the question of the students because we need people to go out to these schools, to these places. All of the institutions have worked up a whole range of ways of working with people and students are deeply interested in this subject. We're now working, for example, in with the Shoah Foundation and others with how students can interact with testimony and become active learners themselves by inquiring of the databases of testimony all the way through. If you're a child survivor and you haven't dealt with your own memoirs and your own memories, now is the time, don't wait. There are a whole range of responsibilities that you have to assume, and you can speak with the authority of your own experience. Other questions? Yes, sir. Don't you agree that Germany was fighting one against the Allies and the Russians, and one against the Jews. They lost the first war, and as a testimony of all of these survivors, 
Let me let me uh, repeat that. Do I not agree? And the answer is I do, but I'm going to correct you in one slight thing. Germany fought two wars. They fought the war against the Jews, a racial war, and they also fought the war, uh, the World War. They were decisively defeated in the World War, and they almost succeeded in the war against the Jews. But I want to tell you something that one of the greatest examples of their failure in the war against the Jews is the children of survivors. And let me give you a concrete illustration of that. I interviewed many years ago a man, and some of you have heard me tell the story, but it's my favorite story. I interviewed a man um, from Boston by the name of Rabbi Arnold Weider, now of blessed memory. And Rabbi Weider said that he learned to be a mole in Bergen-Belsen. Because his father was a mole, and in Bergen-Belsen was a displaced persons camp after the war. And he circumcised Jewish um, boys, I guess we can say boys because we don't circumcise girls. <laughs> he circumcised Jewish boys who were born and Jewish boys who could not be circumcised during the war. And I pondered what he had said to me. And I said, isn't this amazing? For six years, if you lowered your trousers and you were a man, you could be killed. And on the seventh year, without any sense of that the world was safe, or that the world would be safe in the future, Jewish parents dared to circumcise their sons. Makes no rational sense. Meaning the genius of what happened in places like Bergen-Belsen is the opposite of what happened with the Madeleine Albright's family of the world. Not a criticism of Madeleine Albright, who was my colleague at Georgetown. The Jews of Bergen-Belsen decided to be Jews. And they dared to bring children into a world knowing full well the fragility of the world, the danger of the world, the destructiveness of the world, and they dared to indelibly mark their sons as Jews. That's a miracle of Jewish history. Contrary to anything you could imagine possible in a world in which they had just experienced what they had experienced. All of you know, who are children of survivors, the way in which your parents had invested in you precisely because they were afraid that they were going to be the last Jews on earth if they made it. Now, the bad news, we haven't recovered demographically from the Shoah yet. Seventy years, there are still less Jews in the world today than there were 80 years ago. Another five, ten years will capture us, so imagine what was lost. Next question, ma'am. And I'm glad to have you on my left. Thank you very much. But uh, I'm talking about, you're not speaking about speaking in for high school students from elementary school uh, uh, schools and so on. I'm wondering why second and third generation does take an active part in colleges and universities, and why do we get the PBS? Our speaker of anti Semitism when our young people do not defend us. Okay, why do we have, why do we have BDS and why are young people not defending us? Let me say, I don't want to deal with that long, but I will say one thing about BDS. It's actually three very short things. Whoops, what happened? Jeez. I understand Mike's not looking. I, didn't, I certainly didn't shut it off. 
Three very brief things about BDS. If you can hear me in the back, raise your hand. Okay. Three very, uh, very brief things about BDS. One, it's not going to succeed. Can't succeed. And that, despite all the craziness of it, the reason it can't succeed is twofold. Number one, the, this is an expression of rage, and the expression of rage is not going to move in.